Now our guest tonight, uh, Tariq Modoud, is Professor of Sociology, Politics, and Public Policy, and the founding director of the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Citizenship at the University of Bristol. He's also the co-founder of the international journal Ethnicities, and in the last few years, he was a Rob Robert Schumann Fellow at the university in U European University in Florence, uh, and a thinker in residence at the Royal Academy of Flanders in Brussels. Professor Modoud is a prolific author. He has about three dozens um, uh, uh, of authored, co-authored, and edited books and reports. He has published over 200 articles and chapters, and he's also an active blogger and has recently, in August, I think, published a very interesting piece on multicultural nationalism. And as a Canadian, uh, <laughs> I was especially interested in that concept. Uh, so I invite you to check that on the website Open Democracy. His latest books include Multiculturalism, A Civic Idea, Multiculturalism, Rethought, Multiculturalism and Interculturalism, Debating the Dividing Lines, and The Problem of Religious Diversity, European Problems, Asian Challenges. He also has a new book coming out this spring uh, entitled Rethinking Political Secularism, The Multiculturalist Challenge. Uh, and the lecture he's giving today, Islamophobia and the Struggle for Recognition, for recognition will be included in that volume. So I, um, I invite you to check uh, his website, actually, to have the exact date of publication of that book. So now I'm pleased to leave the floor to our, distri to our distinguished guest, Professor Tariq Modoud. Thank you. Thank you, Genevieve. <coughs> and, um, Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. I, I'm, I'm really honored and pleased to um, have the chance to address you with, with this talk. It was not very long ago that Anglophone scholars of racism understood it in terms of biology and specifically in terms of the black-white binary. At the same time, other scholars especially in continental Europe, understood racism in terms of anti-Semitism, <laughs> especially in the recent biologized forms that Europe has manifested. When it began to be clear that these two paradigms were failing to capture some contemporary experiences, such as anti-Asian cultural racism in Britain or anti-Arab cultural racism in France, some scholars began to move away from these paradigms. Yet following the assertive Muslim agency triggered off by the Satanic Verses Affair, the, the novel by the author Salman Rushdie, and other Muslim controversies, as Muslims responded to such hostilities and articulated their misrecognition, they were constantly told that there is no such thing as anti-Muslim racism because Muslims are a religious group and not a race. Hence, Muslims could legitimately ask for toleration and religious pluralism, but not for inclusion in anti-racist egalitarian analyses and initiatives. While this view continues to be expressed even today, and some deny that there is a racism that could be labeled Islamophobia, it no longer has the hegemony it once had. The origins of the term Islamophobia have been variously traced to an essay, sorry, to an essay by two French Orientalists, to a neologism of the 1970s, to an early 1990s American periodical, and indeed, even to an article of mine. I actually know it wasn't me. I didn't invent the term. But it turns out, um, now that further research has been done, it turns out that uh, my use of it, my first use of it in 1991, is the sixth use of it uh, in English in print. What is less disputed is that the term received its public pu policy prominence with the running me trust Commission on British Muslims and Islamophobia in 1997. 
defined as, I quote, an unfounded hostility towards Islam and therefore fear or dislike of all or most Muslims. While a number of Anglophone authors, including myself, started using the concept of Islamophobia in the late 1980s and early 1990s, it was the Runnymede Trust's 1997 report which launched the career of the term as a concept of public discourse in Britain and much beyond it. While the report was groundbreaking and played a crucial role in getting people to think about anti-Muslim prejudice, I felt it did not sufficiently locate Islamophobia as a racism, like, say, anti-Semitism. I continued to write about Islamophobia as a form of cultural racism, which may be built on racism based on physical appearance, for example, color racism, but was a form of racism in its own right, again, like anti-Semitism. This also became the approach of UNESCO, and I'm pleased to say that it has been explicitly embraced by the new 2017 Runnymede Trust report. So Runnymede Trust, for those of you who don't know, is a think tank, a leading think tank in issues to do with race and minorities uh, based in London. So in this talk, I want to bring together five propositions. And there's no suspense. I'll tell you what they are right now. <laughs> so here you go. Islamophobia is a form of othering or cultural racism. Two, a racialized group cannot be reduced to a race. Three, critique of othering presupposes a normative framework which needs to be justified. Four, critique of Islamophobia presupposes a normative framework which needs to be justified. Oh dear, I seem to have repeated that twice. We'll sort that out as we go along. Um, and lastly, Islamophobia can be distinguished from reasonable criticism of Islam and, and Muslims. So I'm obviously going to take them in that order. So I'll begin with the first one. Islamophobia is a form of othering or cultural racism. Islamophobia is a form of cultural racism because while the perception and treatment of Muslims clearly has a religious and cultural dimension, it equally clearly bears a physical appearance or ancestral component. For while it is true that Muslim is not a biological category in the way that black or South Asian or Chinese is, neither was Jew. In that instance, it took a long non-linear history of racialization to turn an ethno-religious group into a race. More precisely, the latter did not so much as replace the former, but superimposed itself because even though no one denied that Jews were a religious community with a distinctive language or languages, culture or cultures, and religion, Jews still came to be seen as a race, and of course with horrific consequences. Similarly, Bosnian Muslims were ethnically cleansed because they came to be identified as a racial group, that is to say, as having a perceived line of descent by people who actually were phenotypically, linguistically, and culturally the same or very similar to themselves. The ethnic cleanser, unlike an inquisitor, wasted no time in finding out what people believed, if and how often they went to a mosque, and so on. The victims were racially identified as Muslims in terms of membership based on a perceived line of descent. Race, then, as I understand it, is not just about biology or even color. For while racialization has to pick on some features of a people related to physical appearance and ancestry, otherwise racism cannot be distinguished from other forms of groupism, physical appearance need only be a marker and not necessarily denote a form of determinism. 
This is illustrated in the conceptualization of cultural racism as what elsewhere I've called a two-step process. While biological racism is the antipathy, exclusion, and unequal treatment of people on the basis of their physical appearance or other imputed physical differences, you know, for example, their non-whiteness, cultural racism builds on biological racism, though it doesn't have to, it just, as a matter of fact, builds on biological racism, a further discourse which evokes cultural differences from an alleged, for example, British or civilized norm to vilify, marginalize, or demand cultural assimilation from groups who may also suffer from biological racism. Post-war racism in Britain has been simultaneously culturalist and biological. And while the latter is essential to the racism in question, it is in fact the less explanatory aspect of a complex phenomenon. Biological interpretations have not governed what white British people, including racists, have thought or done. How they've stereotyped, treated, and related to non-whites. And biological ideas have had increasingly less force, both in the context of personal relationships and in the conceptualization of groups. As white people's interactions with non-white individuals increased, they did not become necessarily less conscious of group differences, but they were far more likely to ascribe group differences to upbringing, customs, forms of socialization, and self-identity than to biological hereditary. The interesting question arises as to whether it could be a one-step racism. That is to say, could color racism decline and fade away, and yet cultural racism, that is to say, seeing a descent-based people as culturally other, remain and perhaps even grow? I just asked that question speculatively. It's not really all that likely to happen, certainly not tomorrow, and my paper's not concerned with it. But it is worth thinking about in the kind of long term. And uh, certainly, it's a speculative question that can help us to get our analytical idea about race correct, you know, if I'm right. Cultures and cultural practices are usually internally diverse, containing and omitting various authentic elements and adaptations and mixes. To racially group all Jews or Muslims together as one cultural race or as one ethno-religious entity is to then um, catch most, if not all, cultural minorities in that targeted group. So, you know, there'd be a cultural diversity, but if you tried to capture them in one group, racialized group, then... Um, you'd be catching a number of different cultural variations. For example, a non-religious Muslim might still be targeted as a cultural Muslim or Muslim by community, which of course means Muslim by background, which means birth and ancestry. So <laughs> you might think it's, it's just a form of cultural racism but if, you, if it included people who, especially if you thought it was uh, some kind of just a, a religious intolerance, but the target of that intolerance caught Muslims who were not religious, then it couldn't be described as a religious intolerance. Uh, even if, say, the racists thought that's what they were doing, though it's unlikely that they would, but let's suppose in, in an extreme case that the racist self-described their hostility in a particular way, but nevertheless targeting non-religious Muslims in the way that the Bosnian Serbs did in Bosnia clearly means that the group has been racialized and it's not simply a religious intolerance that we're talking about. Hence my point 
that Muslims, no less than Jews, are identified racially and not simply in terms of religious beliefs or religious behavior. Moreover, if we accept that racism does not necessarily involve attributing qualities which inhere in a deterministic law-like way in all members of a group, then we do not have to rule out cultural racism as an example of racism. As such, we should guard against the characterization of racism as a form of inherentism or biological determinism, which leaves little space to conceive the ways in which cultural racism draws upon physical appearance as one marker amongst others. So that was my first proposition. My second one, a racialized group cannot be reduced to a race. So in a way, I'm now kind of moving in the other direction. Having said, oh, Muslims are a so-called religious group who actually can be racialized, I now want to say a group like Muslims who are racialized can't be reduced to their racialization. I hope that will make sense as I go along. While understanding some contemporary treatment of Muslims and aspects of their societal status in terms of racialization clearly is an advance, we should beware that the conceptualization of Muslims in the West is not reduced to racialization or any other othering theoretical frame such as Orientalism. By definition, othering sees a minority in terms of how a dominant group negatively and stereotypically imagines that minority as something other, as inferior or threatening and to be excluded. Indeed, the dominant group typically projects its own fears and anxieties onto the minority. Minorities, however, are never merely projections of dominant groups, but have their own subjectivity and agency through which they challenge how they are perceived, or more precisely, misperceived, and seek to not be defined by others, but to supplant negative and exclusionary stereotypes with positive and prideful identities. Oppressive misrecognitions thus sociologically imply and politically demand recognition. Our analyses, therefore, should be framed in terms of a struggle for recognition. I don't actually say much about recognition in this talk because it's something I've written about a number of times and it's covered elsewhere in other chapters in the book that um, Genevieve uh, mentioned. But basically, I'm borrowing um, from Charles Taylor here. I'm sure you're very familiar with uh, his uh, seminal essay on multiculturalism and the politics of recognition. And so using his idea of recognition as allowing people to express and adapt and grow their own identities, including mixed identities. He doesn't always put it in quite this way, but I would extend it, including mixed identities, identities like, say, American Muslims. So I don't interpret, to use the Taylorian term, authenticity in some kind of essentialized way or that it's an identity that it always st uh, stays the same or it, it just comes from the past and we just just relive it and so on. I mean, identities are always you know, changing and mixing and so on. Um, and so recognition for me is about the identities of people who are otherwise marginalized or misrecognized and including those identities, you know, correctly identified as it were, coming from the minorities themselves as opposed to from the outside, the dominant outsiders and including in the recognition of those identities in the larger collective identities, such as, say, Americans. So including American Muslims in the larger identity of Americans. So that, for me, is part of what I mean by recognition. Um, and so it's, it, it has one particular, I and mean, there are a number of uh, differences I have with 
uh, the way Charles Taylor does it and how I've used it. But one important one, perhaps, just to mention, is that Taylor tends to think of, at least in that essay, tends to think of uh, recognition as a psychological concept. I don't. So for me, it's to do with civic status, civic standing, inclusion or exclusion in a uh, body of uh, citizenry. It includes feelings and subjectivities, such as rejection and acceptance, but at a societal level. So I'm not interested in the psychological processes when I'm talking about recognition and misrecognition. Um, recognition, of course, does not mean thinking of Muslims as a group with uniform attributes or a single mindset, all having the same view on religion, personal morality, politics, the international world order, and so on. In this respect, Muslims are just like any other group. They cannot be understood in terms of a single essence. No one in the social sciences thinks that identities are based on cognitive or behavioral properties that are shared by all who may be members of a relevant group, such as women, black people, gay and lesbians, and so on. If group members do not share a common essence, then they cannot be simply demarcated from non-group members because there will be many cases where individuals are not simply on one side of the boundary or the other. You know, they're on both sides of the boundary. So groups cannot have discrete nor indeed fixed boundaries as these boundaries may vary across time and place, across social contexts, and will be the subject of social construction and social change. This anti-essentialism, perhaps a term you recognize, that it's used a lot in the literature I, re I read, and in a way it's taken for granted. Nobody now says they're an essentialist. Everybody, all of us, we all want to be anti-essentialists. We attack essentialists, but we rarely say who they are, um, certainly, as it were, amongst our own scholarly communities. The essentialists are supposed to be as it were, the ignorant barbarians outside the academy. So I hope you understand what, that what I've just summarized is a pretty consen consensual understanding of anti-essentialism. This anti-essentialism is rightly deployed in the study of Islamophobia and Muslims. It's a powerful way of handling ascriptive discourses, of showing that various popular or dominant ideas about Muslims just as in the case of women, gays, and so on, are not true as such, but are aspects of socially constructed images that have been made to stick onto those groups of people because the ascribers are more powerful than the ascribed. Anti-essentialism is an intellectually compelling idea and a powerful resource in the cause of equality. It is also common, though, for authors to accuse each other of essentialism. <laughs> this is because there are different versions of anti-essentialism. To pave the way for my third and fourth propositions, I want to briefly rehearse two interpretations which I discussed in my book, Multiculturalism, some years ago. The first is the skeptical interpretation that the critique, you know, the anti-essentialist critique, that the critique kills the groups as real entities, and they only live on as ascriptions or reactions to ascriptions or political make-believe. Rogers Brubaker, for example, argues, I quote, ethnicity, race, and nation are not things in the world, but perspectives on the world, ways of seeing, interpreting, and representing the social world. One way to interpret this claim might be to conclude that there's something false, fictitious, and illegitimate about appeals to culture, ethnicity, and so on in understanding oneself, let alone others, or society. Stuart Hall's words sometimes lend themselves to this radical conclusion. I quote, if we feel we have a unified identity 
It's only because we construct a comforting story or narrative of the self about ourselves. The fully unified, completed, secure, and coherent identity is a fantasy. Skeptics, like the ones I've just mentioned, do not necessarily want to kill off worthwhile political projects around, say, a black identity or feminism. And so some allow for something called strategic essentialism, where pretending that there's a black or national identity is permitted because of the politics. But analysts know that these identities are necessary fictions, to use Hall's phrase. I think, however, groups are not just strategically but conceptually necessary to both social science and to anti-racism or egalitarian politics. And so I offered an alternative interpretation of anti-essentialism in this book that I mentioned. I suggested that Wittgenstein's concept of, this is Ludwig Wittgenstein, the mid-20th century um, philosopher originally from Vienna, spent a lot of his working life at Cambridge, England. I suggested that Wittgenstein's concept of family resemblance offers a way of recognizing that just as it does not make sense to say that games or languages do not exist because they do not share a common definitional essence, I won't go into his example now, but he's, he has this famous example by saying, what, what is it that games have in common? And think about it, but not while you're listening to me. But think about it later. And actually, we can't come up with one thing that all games have in common. We can talk about it later, maybe over a drink or something. Um, so I want to say that just as it does not make sense to say that games or languages do not exist. I mean, baseball exists. Monopoly exists. Even if we can't find a single essence that cuts across all games. So it doesn't make sense to say they don't exist because they do not share a common definitional essence. So the lack of group essences and discrete bounded populations with unchanging characteristics was not a good reason to assert in an a priori way that groups did not exist. You might, as an empirical conclusion, come to that view. But you couldn't begin your analysis by saying, oh, by the way, groups don't exist. They're just a unnecessary fiction. Rather, we had to have a more flexible, looser, and variable notion of a group and of group membership that allowed for open textured and overlapping boundaries and overlapping memberships. If it seems difficult to reconcile this with our a priori concept of group, let us call the entities something else. You know, let's call them groupings. The key point was that once we stopped demanding that groups measure up to our impossible definitions, because that's what the problem is. The skeptic ends up where they end up, i.e. groups are an illusion, they're a fiction, because they have an exaggerated view of what a group must be. So if you, if you start off with an impossible definition, it's not surprising you say that the thing that you're looking for doesn't exist. So the key point was, that once we stopped demanding that groups measure up to our impossible definitions, we would lose the temptation to conclude that groups suffered from an ontological deficiency, that there were merely, to quote Brubaker, perspectives upon the world, ontologically no superior to the products of othering. Another way of putting it is that just as the complete self-made individual of some liberal theories does not exist, it does not follow that individuals do not exist, that we have to give up individual from social so science vocabularies, so similarly with groups. So that's the second proposition. My third, oh, no, it's not, sorry, I got a bit more. No, I haven't, beg your pardon. Yeah, so critique of othering presupposes a normative framework which needs to be justified. The value of othering as a way of studying minorities is that it can be used to challenge blanket generalizations about a minority. Othering sometimes takes the form of attributing certain features to a group, which are alleged to be found 
in all members of the group. All blacks are muggers, all Muslims are fanatics, and so on. Theorists of racialization typically add that even when no explicit biological ideology is in play, these generalizations are being asserted by the racists in a quasi-naturalistic way. That is to say that like the laws of nature, they brook no exceptions. The problem with this is that it's an implausible analysis of racialized thinking. Racists often do admit of counterexamples. My best friend is black and no mugger, and if only all blacks could be like that. But alas, they're not. Moreover, these racialized statements, which identify groups on the basis of their physical appearance, are not necessarily seeking biological or natural bases for the racialized generalizations. The racializer is unlikely to believe that black mugging and Muslim fanaticism is genetic, and much more likely to think that it is something to do with upbringing, family structure, community norms, etc. In short, what we might call culture, in the manner of cultural racism that I've already described. Yes, the concept of othering has the power to point out to racists that their generalizations do not hold of every member of the putative race, that their thinking suffers from quasi-naturalism or essentializes the group. However, you know, if that's your critique, all the racist has to, do, has to do to escape the critique is to say they're not talking about all members, but some members, or many members, or most members, or more precisely, of more members than is true for other groups or society as a whole. So it's not really much of a victory over racism. So to make effective the anti-racist critique, one needs to engage with probabilistic statements. And that means relating it to what is known or can be researched empirically about the population in question. More fundamentally, the question that my discussion here raises is, when a dominant group attributes certain characteristics to a subordinate group, how do we work out which of those characteristics that are meant to constitute the otherness of the minority is an imagined and malign projection onto the minority, and which is a genuine feature of cultural difference. Another way of putting this is that the analysis of othering is not a self-sufficient intellectual perspective or disciplinary inquiry. For example, as Orientalism, or anti-racism studies. It is dependent on an inquiry into the group as such, and not just its othering. If we knew nothing about Muslims, we would have no way of knowing that they were being othered. How would we know they were being othered? We just have to accept whatever description is offered. It's only because we can doubt the othering because we have some other way of knowing something about Muslims. I hope that makes sense. I hope that you'll um, kind of understand the point I'm making because I, I do have a lot more to say about that. Well, not a lot more, another couple of pages. But I feel uh, for the sake of uh, you know, fitting into the time available, I'm going to leave that bit out. Um, but of course, if anything's unclear, please do ask me in, in the, um, the Q&A. So um, this is then the fourth proposition. Critique of Islamophobia presupposes a normative framework which needs to be justified. So I was afraid that I'd repeated two of the propositions. I haven't. So. OK. Othering nearly always identifies the group in question in terms of negative features. These can take many different forms. Some of the most common are to do with having lower intelligence, less capable of disciplined, responsible behavior, and with a propensity for criminal or violent behavior. In relation to Muslims, some of the negative traits are an obsession with religion over other aspects of life, 
moral conservatism, especially in relation to sexuality, patriarchy, tendency to act on religion or politics in extreme and violent ways. I mean, of course, we're all familiar, familiar with those. Analysis of othering is clearly an important tool when it can be deployed to show the operation of these negative perceptions in the media, in news reports, in political discourses, and the way public concerns are raised and expressed. For example, in relation to what is called radicalization in Britain and Europe, perhaps here as well, um, or women's dress, in television program content, in the activities of the security services, and so on. There is, however, a limitation to such analyses of othering or racialization. Namely, that sometimes there's a lack of agreement between those doing the othering and those being othered about whether certain features are necessarily negative. Most people will agree that to describe a group as less intelligent is to have said something negative about it. But is this the case with religious strictness and moral conservatism? Here it is possible that the dominant group may take one view of the matter, namely that such attitudes and behaviors are negative and backward. But the minority, that is to say, substantial numbers within the minority, may refuse that such characterizations are negative. In recent years, we've seen this most starkly in Europe in the dominant society's view that wearing the hijab, the headscarf, or the burqa, the face veil or the full head-to-toe dress, by Muslim women is a sign of oppression. Despite the dominant society Despite the dominant society delivering this judgment through the popular and intellectual media, the numbers of women engaged in such practices has increased. And the increase has been ac accompanied by the women in question saying that they're choosing to don such clothes out of choice and not as compliance with the demands of Muslim men. To accept, to qualify, or to resist such Muslim women's perspective is not just a matter of empirical inquiry. You know, we can go out and do some research, sure. In fact, loads have been done. It's not just a matter of empirical inquiry, but invokes a normative framework. In recent years, aspects of feminism and liberalism, sometimes described as Western feminism, and to use a phrase that Prime Minister David Cameron used, muscular liberalism, have been cynically and insincerely, insincerely used to critique and undermine various Muslim practices and claims for accommodation, including issues of women's dress. So I'm sure everyone's familiar with that. You should be, if you're not. I mean, it happens every day of the week. However, not all such appeals have to be cynical or insincere. They can be principled and reasonable. Without trying to spell out in any detail the sincere and insincere versions of these highly complex and varied isms, you know, feminism and liberalism, I'm simply making the point that some such normative framework is necessary. An analysis of othering, for example, of how the fact of living within a hegemonic secularism subtly influences Muslim subjectivity, a view very powerfully argued by Talal Asad, that such a view is incomplete without an appeal to a normative framework. For without that, i.e. without the normative framework, we cannot know to what extent the influence is a result of an exercise of self-interested power, of domination, of what Assad, following Foucault, calls governmentality, and to what extent it is an aspect of benign social change on the part of Muslims themselves, who on a reasoned basis come to adapt their practices and modify their sense of what it means to be a Muslim. So, yes, we need to do some empirical research to answer that question, 
but we've got to have a normative framework in the first place to be able to tell the difference between, as it were, the positive and the negative, between the change as a result of domination and the change as a result of Muslims choosing to change or, you know, some of them change, choosing to change or debating and so on. To stick with my earlier example, to argue that the hijab or niqab or burqa are or are not a form of oppressive othering is not just a matter of empirical inquiry or discourse analysis, but implicitly or explicitly appeal to how to distinguish between what is negative and what is positive in the characterization of Muslims. If it is implicit, it needs to be made explicit. Either way, the normative presuppositions need to be questioned. That is to say, they cannot be taken for granted, but stand in need of argument and justification. Without such justification, not only may an analysis of othering be incomplete or distorted, but it may itself be an exercise in othering, namely in seeing groups in question as prejudicially othered as for example, religious conservatives, when that is exactly how the group may wish to think of itself and to be respected for being as such. This will, of course, be an empirical matter. Hence my earlier point that the critique of othering presupposes empirical knowledge of the other. But depending on the facts, it may also be a refusal to accept the group on its own terms. That may not be wrong as such, my point is that to accept or not to accept will require a normative argument. And so a perspective such as Orientalism or anti-Islamophobia are incomplete without normative argument. So the kind of normative disavowal that one finds in the influential work of Sayyid Talal Assad is misplaced. He's been a powerful force for getting us to rethink secularism, but his conceptual framework does not explicitly help us to determine whether secularism is a, a good thing or which ver version of secularism is better than another. Or to put it another way, everyone will agree that Islamophobia must be distinguished from reasonable criticism of Muslims and aspects of Islam. But not only is this a difficult distinction to make, but it begs the question, what are reasonable criticisms that Muslims and non-Muslims may make or discuss in relation to some Muslim views about, say, gender or education or secularism. Not only must the study of Islamophobia not squeeze out the possibility of such discussion, but by showing us where it becomes Islamophobic, it should help us to guide us onto the terrain of reasonable dialogue. Merely identifying the unreasonable and the populist is not enough. Our frames of analysis should lead us to the reasonable, to what criticisms may be made of Muslims and or Islam, and what criticisms that Muslims want to make of contemporary Western societies, too, are worthy of hearing. The minority in question must be able to negotiate, modify, accept criticism, and change in its own way. A dialogue must be distinguished from a one-sided imposition. Islamophobia should therefore be studied within a normative framework, and of course the normative framework on my own that I'm not fully elaborating here is the struggle for recognition or multiculturalism, should be studied within a normative framework and not just one that exposes the normative presuppositions of others while evading the challenge of justifying one's own normative presuppositions. My own framework, multiculturalism or a struggle for recognition and institutional accommodation, prioritizes groups fighting negative outsider perceptions by giving normative and political weight to insider identifications in all their plurality. So I turn to my last point. Islamophobia can be distinguished from reasonable criticism of Islam and Muslims. So having said all I've said, some of them might say, how it may be asked, are we to distinguish reasonable criticism from Islamophobia? 
take the proposition, this one. Muslim views about women are oppressive and not appropriate for modern Britain or modern Europe or modern United States. Is this Islamophobia or reasonable criticism? My suggestion is that we should apply the following five tests. See, I do everything in fives. OK, so five tests. And I'll be, I'm going to be quite brief here and love to discuss this further with you. Firstly, does it stereotype Muslims by assuming they all think the same? Does the criticism or criticism seem to suggest that all or most Muslims have this blameworthy characteristic and that this feature defines Muslims, indeed drowns out any worthy characteristics and ignores contextual factors? Okay, so that's one. Two, is it about Muslims or a dialogue with Muslims which they would wish to join? Does the mode of criticism consist of generalizing about a group in a way that tends to exclude them rather than treat them as conversational partners who share common concerns? Three, is mutual learning possible? For example, one may criticize some Muslims for sexual conservatism or puritanism, but is one willing to listen to those Muslims who think that contemporary societies like Britain or the United States are over-sexualized and encourage sexually predatory and undignified behavior? Of course, particularly pertinent at the moment in the light of the Me Too movement and various revelations that that's uh, been part of. So that's three. I've got a couple of other examples there. Older women, schooling, and so on, but I'll leave those out. Um, fourth, is the language civil and contextually appropriate? Is the behavior or practice being criticized, uh, is the behavior or practice being criticized in an offensive way and seems to make Muslims the target rather than stick to the issue? A good analogy here is how reasonable contextual criticism of Zionism can become a diatribe against Jewish people as such. Of course, it needn't do. But when it does, we know we've gone beyond critique of Zionism into anti-Semitism. Fifthly, lastly, is it insincere criticism for ulterior motives? Does the person doing the criticism really care about the issue or is using it to attack Muslims in the way that many use feminism and homosexuality. I mean, in Britain, you could say uh, the presence of Muslims has been a, a great boon, is a great uh, uh, dynamic for social liberalism because till the end of the 20th century, most people who thought of themselves as conservatives with a small C and even with a large C, meaning the Conservative Party, um, wouldn't have called themselves uh, feminists. They would not have uh, supported, for instance, gay marriage and so on. But now they all do. In fact, more than supported, they say these are fundamental British values. And the only people who apparently don't are Muslims, so they can't really be very British. So I say, if the answer to any of my five questions is a yes, then we may be dealing with Islamophobia or anti-Muslim racism. I'll stop there. <laughs> Gosh, I haven't, hope I haven't kind of browbeaten you into silence. <laughs> Maybe I went on too long. I'll go first. <laughs> um, Andrew Shryock, Department of Anthropology. You've written in several locations about um, anxieties in Europe about 
religiosity and religious groups, minorities, and how one advocates for and against them. And many progressives, anti-racists, might have issues with religiosity in general, which makes it hard for them to advocate in a strong or sincere or even tactical way for Muslims. Your, your five um, steps here are, are very good. Um, working them out on the ground would be all the fun of it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, so many times you can see that these are exactly the issues that are percolating up whenever people engage in criticism or uh, advocacy on behalf of Muslims, which is not really about Islam or Muslims or what they believe or how they think or what they are. It's simply a kind of philic protectionism. So I, I'm, I'm wondering if you could say more about your generic European uh, allergies to religiosity and religion and how that weaves back into everything you've been saying. Yeah. Yes, that's uh, a fair, fair point, um, uh, Andrew. Um, I mean, people have observed, I mean, there's a um, couple of uh, articles by American authors. Um, um, Ari Zolberg, for instance, had one, and more recently, uh, Nancy Foner and Richard Alba have, have argued how, isn't it odd that in the United States, religion and founding you know, religious uh, associations, religious communities, um, which can act as community centers and self-help um, associations um, where families can meet on Sundays and keep their heritage alive, not just religious heritage, a language like Chinese or Korean and so on. That all these things are uh, understood by the American public and by American social scientists as uh, positive uh, dynamics of integration. Like, this is one of the ways you become American. You go to your God on Sundays. In, the, in Europe, it's just the opposite. It's, if you're religious, people are wary of you and say, oh, uh, where have you come from? Because we're not that religious here, so you're now standing out. And actually, we think religion's a bit of a problem because religious people tend to start shouting and arguing and trying to convert us and trying to regulate our behavior and so on. So we are suspicious about people who are either too religious uh, in terms of a kind of organized way or are too uh, projecting of their religion onto the public space. Um, you can be politically radical. You can be anti-British imperialism, anti-French civilization, well, maybe not that, probably. But um, <laughs> you can, certainly you can be anti-British civilization in Britain and have a large following. I mean, that's not very difficult. That's OK. You know, you'd be regarded as a, a champion of the oppressed and a, a speaker for radicalism. And of course, there are radical traditions in Europe. And so you can um, connect with those traditions and broaden those connect, uh, traditions. But if you want to speak religion in, a, in the European public space. This is now true of just about every single uh, European country. You know, 25, 50 years ago, you'd have said, oh, well, that's more true of some rather than others. But actually, um, that particular feature of secularization has spread from Northwest Europe now across the whole of Europe. Um, that, that's regarded as quite worrying. And if you were Christian, that would be worrying. And if you are Muslim, that's like especially worrying. Um, and so people like religious people, uh, people meaning uh, Europeans in general, like religious people who are, as it were, a little bit uh, self-effacing about their religion or do it in private places, out of sight, as it were, at weekends and where no one else is looking. You know, so Buddhist, that's nice, you know. Nobody ever sees a Buddhist in, you know, uh, Trafalgar Square or in any public place. That's, that's good. 
you know. Um, and I, so that is just a contextual factor that um, any group that makes religion central to their group identity would find a problem. And then, of course, if you add all the other things, you know, the, the political polarization, the so-called war on terror, the terrorism, and all these other things, uh, you know, you've then got uh, a much thicker and more complex set of anxieties and worries as well. And then some of the ones that I was raising, like, for example, this example about gender equality. I think gender equality has been used by various um, politicians and media commentators and you know opinion leaders in Europe in a very cynical and Islamophobic way. But of course, it doesn't have to be, and it hasn't been only that. There are a lot of people who are genuinely committed to gender equality and who are nervous about what they see about the practice of certain Muslim communities. And so then they must be able to, of course, express that point. And, but my, you know, uh, what I'm arguing here is we must find ways of distinguishing between criticism and Islamophobia, uh, between, a, in particular, dialogical criticism, which means that the criticism can come both ways, um, and rather than a kind of a disciplinary discourse against Muslims, which sees Muslims as a threat, as negative, as aliens. Um, and unfortunately, the two can run into each other. And because they can, uh, as you know from uh, our shared interest in the study of Islamophobia, then some uh, sociologists and critical social theorists lump all criticism and questioning about Muslims as Islamophobic because, you know, they say, well, why make the effort to separate the two? Especially if it's, if it's uh, going to have, end up having the same effect, um, which it can do, of course, because people can't always control the effects. So if there's a, a very Islamophobic public climate of opinion, even the sincere feminist questioner can contribute to that climate, uh, of course. So, so, so some um, social scientists and uh, students of Islamophobia then say, well, it's all Islamophobic. All we need is a study of Islamophobia, and we don't need all the stuff that I've been talking about as the normative framework, which helps us to distinguish uh, between different kinds of of discourses and, uh, and legitimate discourses from racializing discourses and so on. Um, but I think th if that approach is actually not the scholarly approach, it's, it's more the, the anxious activist approach. And while we might all react like that in some times and places, I think we also need a more reflective space and an analytical framework that allows us to to see principled arguments as well as uh, Islamophobic discourses. I'm Margaret Summers, uh, Department of Sociology and History. Thank you. Uh, that was really, really great. Um, and I especially, I especially like the argument about questioning the normativity, well, first making explicit that there is, that there are normative um, foundations that need to be themselves um, recognized as presuppositions which have themselves no grounding necessarily. Um, but I wanted to talk about the last, um, the test, mm. which I found absolutely fan fabulous. Um, however, what worries me about it, it wor is that it reminded me of Habermas's f fabulous public sphere, which exists exactly in the mind of Habermas and nobody, <laughs> n nowhere else, sort of like Rawls's 
um, imaginative, you know, I forget, uh, the, ve the veil of ignorance. Um, Habermas imagined that people stepped into the public sphere, left their identities on the outside, left the inequalities and relations of domination on the outside, left their genders on the outside, and walked in and everyone was equal and everyone was um, unthreatened by other people's conversation. And um, so, for example, we know perfectly well that um, the cri difference, bet the criticism of Israel versus the critique of anti-Semitism is about as taken, a, is, is, is just not accepted, right? That distinction, except by a few people, mostly academics probably, and even so. Um, uh, in this university, this very moment, we're having a crisis. I don't know if you know I, about I it. I know a little about it. Okay, so. I read the papers. <laughs> um, that's one example, but another example is in terms of, of Islam, um, you, it's very difficult to have that kind of a, of a public sphere um, liberal conversation when, you're, when you already have relations of domination. So it's not as simple as saying, I'm really sincere um, <laughs> about my criticism. I don't have ulterior motives, but the person who is receiving is on the on the end, uh, the receiving end of the criticism. If if so, for example, they're Muslim in Britain, they already are in a position of domin of being dominated by the questioner, who pre presumably is not Muslim. Um, it gets more complicated with feminism um, because women. Are, sometimes are and sometimes are not. I mean, white women maybe with uh, male Muslims. I mean, it's there is there are a lot of moving parts. But um, and so insincere criticism for ulterior. I mean, I love the. I, I really love your argument about the fake, um, the fake feminists um, on the right. Um, who really care so deeply about feminism until they don't. Um, so I'm thinking of, um, well, I'll stop there. I'm, I'm starting to get obsessed about Republican senators and the We Too movement, but um, then I'll start tearing my hair out. And <laughs> so I'll leave it. Yeah. And see. Um, OK, well, starting at the beginning of what, of what you said, Margaret, about uh, Habermas and, um, or even Rawls, that uh, it reminded you, you know, this kind of evoked that for you. Well, there are uh, significant differences between what I want to argue and the kind of Habermasian approach. So, um, as I mentioned, I'm much more influenced by Charles Taylor. So, uh, with Charles Taylor, um, identities, as it were, go quite a long way down. They're quite deep. And there's no expectation that people want to say, oh, well, as I enter the rational space, I'm going to leave my identities at the door. Just the opposite. People want to enter that space because they may be anxious about threats to their identities. Um, so the last thing they're going to do is leave them at the door. And the arguments that they will uh, be interested in and that they'll mount and so on will all be, in a sense, identity related. Um, so, that, so in, in no sense, in that sense, am I trying to have a de-subjectivized, objective, rational public sphere. So I'm, I'm very uh, skeptical in the way that you suggested about Habermas's uh, idiosyncratic view only in his own head. Very uh, skeptical about the over-rationalization of the public sphere. And I also think, I haven't argued that here, I have uh, elsewhere, that um, we learn through conflict, and sometimes that conflict can be violent. So I just made a very passing reference to the Satanic Verses affair. Now, that was obviously a very violent affair. Um, I'd, I'd, you know physical and discursive levels, at uh, political and uh, societal levels. 
But actually, I think a lot of people learnt a lot from it. I think, I think it changed British society in certain ways. Um, first of all, they, they recognized that there were Muslims present and not just black and brown people. So that was a, a big learn. But uh, beyond that, um, I don't know whether you remember, but in 2006, a Danish newspaper, um, Jutland's Posten, published a set of cartoons often referred to as the Muhammad cartoons. And that was another big crisis, like the Satanic Verses one. And several newspapers, you know, leading European newspapers in Paris, in Berlin, and um, Madrid, and so on, they republished the Danish cartoons as they saw it uh, out of a form of solidarity for European values and free speech and so on, even though people were rioting, especially uh, in Saudi Arabia and Syria and so on, people being killed and, and so on. Um, not a single national paper, newspaper or magazine, republished the cartoons in Britain because it was just thought as gratuitously <laughs> offensive. And I think without the Rushdie affair, Britain would have done it. The British editors would have just said, hey, look, let's march in solidarity. And sim similarly, the, uh, uh, the, the more recent uh, free speech after the, uh, you know, all the killings at the Charlie Hebdo offices and so on, and uh, Je suis Charlie and so on, it was very interesting that it had far less British support than it had amongst other Europeans. So I think that Muslims have managed to carry out a little bit of education of, uh, of British public culture. Um, through, um, I mean, through a certain amount of pain. So it's not like a rational seminar. I mean, a lot of people, of course, uh, may learn something but not enjoy the process. Um, and I think that is the kind of arguments that multiculturalist arguments can be. They can be very painful. They can have violence going off, as it were, outside the seminar room, but that can then help to focus issues inside the seminar room. So the two are kind of uh, dialectically related to each other. So I don't have a simple theory about um, it's all to do with the power of ideas and the mind, and we just have seminar ideas and, uh, and so on. I have a question that's about current affairs now in, in, in Europe, and I was wondering if, if you see a different uh, type of Islamophobia um, emerging with the you know, refugee crisis. Um, I mean, I've seen in Eastern Europe, for example, distinction being made between refugees and our Muslims who are kind of na nations in a way that they've been here for a long time. They're almost like indigenous to our culture. Yeah. And these are less dangerous versus new people, so a fear. And if there's new hierarchies of of Muslims within Britain, for example. Some are more British than others. Some are more easily um, you know, integrated than others. And how this might have an impact on, on Muslim community, on the Muslim community if there is some kind of single community or if it's actually pitting different Muslim groups against each other. What's... Mm. Yes, that's really interesting, Genevieve, because I think um, the very short answer to your question is yes, but um, giving it some body. Of course, um, there are, um, if you like, hierarchies of identification with being British or with being French or German and so on. And they can be from both sides. They can be from the majority side and from the minority side, of course. Um, it, it would be very odd if they weren't, because one very important factor is time. You know, if um, you and your family have been in Britain 50 years um, relative to five years, of course you'll have a very different view about yourself and Britain, and whether you are British, for instance, and of course, you know, depending on your age as well. I mean, you know, if, if your um, parents and even grandparents were born in Britain, you'd have a different view of Britain to if you were um, yourself a migrant. So I think th those are, those definitely exist. And in a way, they remind me 
of an earlier phenomenon. So in a number of places, you've heard me make references, comparative references, to anti-Semitism and racialization of Jews and so on. Well, one thing that um, some of you may or may not be aware of was that when in the uh, late 19th, early 20th century, there were you know, all these pogroms in Russia and uh, in Eastern Europe and in Russia, and Jews were fleeing. Of course, many came to the United States at that time. But they were obviously trying to get to wherever they could, other countries, and Britain was one destination, especially as Britain had a certain reputation. I mean, you know, it was a, uh, a global power at the time and so on, and, and, and stood for a certain kind of liberalism. So um, the Jewish people that were already in Britain and were in Britain like over many generations, and some of them were actually part of the establishment. I mean, you know, they made a lot of money. They married into family alliances and, you know, and they were very anglicized. They became very nervous. And they were nervous for um, at least two kinds of reasons. One was that they had uh, similar perceptions of um, the arrivals or the people wanted to come in um, as like, well, they're not really very um, acceptable refugees because, for, of course, they didn't speak English and, and so on, but, you know, they had big beards and funny hats and so on. Um, you know, what, what, are they to do, what are they to us, you know? Um, so in that sense, if you like, they shared the majoritarian perceptions, or at least some of them, stigmatic perceptions. But secondly, they worried about the effect that the new arrivals would have upon them. Oh, so he, all these stereotypes about Jews, stinking Jews, backward Jews, stealing Jews, and so on, they'll think, well, that's our reputation at stake. These people who are supposed to be um, our brothers, as it were, communal brothers, they're actually going to undermine our status. So I think that kind of dynamic is present in different parts of um, certainly Western Europe where uh, Muslim, Muslim settlement has been at least sort of 50 years, 75 years, that sort of period, as opposed to just say the last 25 years. Um, and I think that um, one other factor had in my head a moment ago, but just uh, possibly slipped out. One other factor is, um, oh, well, I, and I think this was implicit in, in what you were asking me, that a lot of um, Muslims in different national settings, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Britain, and so on, actually have very strong identification with that country. Mm -hmm. In fact, I know you'll think it absurd, but this has been found now by at least half a dozen surveys over a 10-year period. Muslims in Britain have a stronger identification with Britain than do non-Muslims. Mm -hmm. Now, this is partly because we have cutting nationalities, Scottish, English, and so on, and they've, be, they've risen in the last 10 to 20 years. And, you know, people like myself and so on, we identify much more with Britain than we do with England, Scotland, Wales, and so on. Though, of course, we identify with those as well, but not in the same way. And so it, it is very funny, it is very interesting that people say that the two groups in the country, in the United Kingdom, who most identify with Britain are... Ulster Protestants and English Muslims. <laughs> but it is a fact. And I think that um, it, is, it is noticeable. No one's, no one's, I think, done a kind of systematic study of this, or if they have, I haven't um, come across it. Um, but Muslims in France tend to be very French. I mean, I can't understand them. I mean, I, it's not just the language thing. I mean, the view that they take of laicite, I think, what? 
That's not laicity. That's an absence of religious freedom. They say, oh, no, 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 we, you know, we're all committed to laicity. I say, okay. And then when they hear my view, they go, but that's so British. We couldn't possibly say that in, in France. And, you know, and, and uh, Muslims in Germany have a strong identification what they see to be the German constitutional values and so on. So, you know, these are our identities. We grow up with them and we want to be part of them. We want to share them with the larger citizenry that we're part of, that we claim to be part of. So if others are denying it, we are kind of asserting it even more strongly. So that leads to more, not less, identification. Um, and I think this is particularly the case with those who have a historic, usually colonial connection with the countries in question. And you, you see this very strongly in Britain and France. So um, people who come from what was once the British Empire and now the Commonwealth and so on, we say, you know, one of the kind of political sloganeering we use is we say, we're over here because you were over there. So we say, we are British. We didn't become British the day we entered this country. We are British. You made us British in the 19th century or the 18th century, whenever it was. We are British, and now we've come home. <laughs> so, but a, a refugee from Syria can't say that. So, yeah. You want to take two or three together sure. and then you make a concluding statement? Yes, sure. Okay. Um, in my help, is that, <laughs> um, Bob Donia, Department of History. Um, this is fantastic, and um, I need to let it sink in a little while before I can, can react to it really um, very intelligently, but. Um, there's one thing that bothered me from the very beginning, and let me say I'm a historian of the Balkans, and so I see kind of a different form of um, discrimination uh, all the time there, which is national discrimination. And um, I guess when you first suggested the concept of cultural racism, I was, I would have in that place first inserted the question of cultural nationalism. A nation being defined as a political concept rather than a racial one. And certainly a political concept with both cultural traits and in many cases it gets, gets racialized at least in the minds of the people who make up the nation. Um, and um, therefore, I would wonder if you would um, allow for, maybe you have, uh, and I missed it, but a process of kind of self-otherization by members of a political community that is a nation, which is then very much a part of uh, what goes on as you've described it to, from that point going forward. And I guess the essence of the question is, is there a difference between this sort of political concept of a nation which gets, in the case of the Bosnian Muslims, is the essence of their identity, uh, and yet they are perceived, um, uh, at the, at the Islamophobia directed against them is because of uh, both their religion and their claim to be a separate nation. Um, and so would you allow for that uh, process as a part of what you're describing here? Hi, Kia Tutsui in sociology. Can you go back to one, two, three of the five tests? Um, so I think question number two probably, and three, but number two, it, it seems to me is critical. Um, I think about 
implementation or realization of universal human rights ideas in local, different various local communities in my research. And really the um, key point there is that uh, the criteria, whether you know, it's an imposition of Western or whatever you know, you know, global norms on local communities or not, is whether local community members have a say in the discussion and the decision, policy decision and decisions and so on. So in this case too, it seems like um, some of the others, like ulterior motives or not, uh, the language is vulgar or civil, those things could change as long as the local Muslim members have a say in the discussion, as long as they can participate in the conversation. So I wonder if you could comment on the importance among those five tests, and to me, two seems quite important. Philip J. Carr, an expat Brit, and uh, now citizen of the heinous Zionist state. <laughs> um, Is that the United States? <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not a Zionist state. Um, two or three random thoughts. I'm not an academic. Number one, Abba Eban, the foreign secretary of the State of Israel, once famously said, an anti-Semite is somebody who hates Jews even more than he really should. And I don't know if you could say that about um, Islamophobia. And number two, the Jewish community in England in the early part of the 20th century that you referred to, that had been there two or three centuries, actually took it in their own hands to anglicize the dirty, smelly, Yiddish-speaking Jews who arrived on British shores. And I'm wondering if that process is happening among uh, the Islamic community. Um, and number three, the old uh, adage of have you ever met a Muslim or had him in your house still is true, of course. But it is nice to see that there are Muslim football players, soccer players, sorry, uh, who are playing for England, and there are Muslim cricketers who are now donning the white shirts of England in test matches. <clears throat> but I would ask if you see uh, any parallel trends, because one of the things that seems to me <clears throat> is that even when uh, there have been some extremely violent acts in the Western world, uh, perpetrated by extreme Muslims. The criticism coming from the mainstream Muslim community has not really been heard. One last question. So I'm Rita Chin, and I'm in the Department of History. Um, Thank you for the talk. I, I um, really found it very thought-provoking, and especially the five tests, um, very um, sort of provocative for, for thinking about um, how to engage in a kind of critical analysis of um, really the contemporary moment. Um, my question is about how um, you would think about the story that you tell and the analysis that you're drawing. Um, you, whether you think of that as, as mostly a British analysis, right? And, and to what extent it is applicable in other European countries? I mean, probably broadly speaking, yes. But I guess what I have in the back of my mind is that France and Germany are not nearly as self-conscious and open about thinking um, of the, the kind of discourse around Islam and Muslims um, as a potentially racist discourse, right? They don't think about racism in the same way. They don't allow for racism to be acknowledged in the same way. And so I wonder to what extent um, the analysis that you're drawing here can really be applicable yet to uh, the broader European context. Yeah. Great. Okay, so um, I'll say something, obviously can't be very much, something um, in relation to each of those. So beginning with uh, cultural nationalism and 
how it might or might not relate to cultural racism. Um, I think, as you know, people make a, a distinction, which probably in the end is not a tenable distinction, but still it serves, uh, offers some illumination between um, what is referred to as a civic nationalism and an ethnic nationalism. And I have a problem with that distinction, but I'll, that won't stop me deploying it in order to answer your question. Uh, um, I mean, in a way, it's, it's about a nationalism based upon uh, political membership and a nationalism based upon dissent. So what you're calling um, a cultural nationalism would be very different between these two different kinds of nationalism. Now, if we take the second kind, you know, the kind that's much more prevalent uh, historically and today in the Balkans, um, then really, if, it, if membership of the nation is to do with dissent, then it's like a race. Because because my definition of a race was um, othering where the marker of othering is physical appearance or ancestry. So actually then that second kind of nationalism, ethnic nationalism, would fit for me, you know, other things uh, being equal, would fit for me as a, as a cultural racism. And I'd have to have a different account in relation to the uh, civic nationalism. I also wouldn't want to uh, talk about uh, cultural nationalism because my interest, um, you know, as, as uh, Rita knows, it's very, it's very British, but then beyond Britain, Western Europe. So I've really got very little to say about Central and Eastern Europe. So if someone said to me, not a single one of your sentences is true if I think about Central Eastern Europe. I just have to say, okay, so what? Um, but within Western Europe, what we're beginning to have, and, and it was implicit, I think, all, all the time, it's just becoming more explicit now, is that the, the Islamophobic discourse is not necessarily rooted in uh, a, a celebration of one's uh, nation or, or nation only. It is civilizational or European. And I borrow this term civilizational from Rogers Brubaker, having criticized him in the lecture. I'll say I think he's got this right. I think uh, it, there is an incipient civilizational racism in Western Europe, and it's coming together. And in, it started off by being you know, these people aren't sufficiently French, or these people aren't really Germans, or th they're not acting very Dutch or British, but underlying that. So you find the people who are supposed to be right-wing nationalists, like Geert Wilders and so on, he's not really a nationalist. He's much more centered around an anti-Islamic position, which is transnational across Western Europe. And we see this with the alternative for Deutschland, and this general idea about Islamization being a European-wide problem. Um, so that's why I prefer to carry on talking about cultural racism uh, for the countries I'm interested in, the context I'm interested in. Um, secondly, your point about um, number two and th three uh, being more important than issues around um, the choice of language, you know, like offensive language. Um, Yes, I entirely agree with that. I mean, the choice of language can make a difference. Uh, so we had a, we had a controversy um, about a month or so ago, two months possibly, uh, in relation to one of our um, relatively famous politicians called Boris Johnson. Have you heard of him? Oh. One time foreign secretary, now just a general wrecker of everything national. Um, so he wrote an article in uh, one of the leading newspapers uh, uh, in which he said Denmark, which had just carried out a, uh, a ban of the wearing of the burqa in various kinds of public places, quite a long list of public places, 
he said, oh, I don't approve of that. That's very liberal and not very British. Um, I think these silly women that look like um, bank robbers or letterboxes, they should be allowed to get on with it. I don't like it and so on. And you can't believe the row that that created because a lot of people actually didn't like being called bank robbers or didn't like their women folk being called bank robbers and letterboxes. So the language made a difference, even though his argument was that he was against the ban of burqa in Denmark brought to Britain. And it's not only now Denmark, most of Western Europe have followed similar legislation. So he was actually taking a liberal in what you might call a pro-Muslim stand, simply as an implication of a liberal position, but he expressed it in such a way, and he did it quite deliberately because he wanted to have on the one hand, I'm a liberal, on the other hand, of course I don't want to pander to these Muslims. So the language can make a difference. But I do think you picked on something important. I haven't properly um, elaborated this. I, I need to think a little bit more about it. But across the five tests, the thread running across them is the idea of dialogue. Because Criticism that takes place in the context of dialogue is very different from criticism which is one way and which is top down. And as you, you know, I, I've said, uh, you know, the kind of political theoretical framework that I work within, I call multiculturalism. It's borrowed from people like Charles Taylor and Biko Parekh and developed by myself. Um, for us, dialogue is very important. So you mentioned human rights and you may or may not have observed that no part of my talk referred to human rights. I want to create arguments that don't depend on human rights. So the concept, one of the underlying concepts that's doing a lot of work for me is equal citizenship, but a particular kind of citizenship and a particular kind of equality, the equality that respects difference, not equality as sameness. So, which again, you find in Charles Taylor's work. So. Um, I, yeah, so I want to develop a kind of dialogical citizenship as the theoretical framework, the normative framework for these arguments. I don't want to appeal to rights, or certainly not human rights. Uh, yes, of course, dialogue and language, of course. Thank you. Yeah, because I want to hold a modest view of human rights. I think we've got far too expansive a view of human rights. I mean, just about everything is said to be a human right. So, um, I mean, you know, the original Declaration of Human Rights, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, um, is relatively limited, but we keep adding to it and so on. And um, I suppose... In the end, I don't know what the normative basis for these things are. We just add them because we think they're good things. But um, by calling them human rights, um, what exactly are we saying? You know, how do we know when something is a human right? I mean, maybe there are loads of books about this yeah. that I haven't read. Well, that can happen, but if you think about it for a minute, there aren't many people who say, this is a very important right. Oh, but by the way, it's not a human right. <laughs> but why not? Not everything can be a human right, so what are the important rights that aren't human rights? So I pref prefer to work within a civic tradition where the rights are those that have been developed through you know, civic processes. And in a democracy, we you know, we know what that kind of uh, entails. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm not, obviously not anti-human rights, but I, I think we should have a, a modest view of human rights so that there's enough space for other kinds of rights. Otherwise, it'll just drown everything out, everything out and we won't know what we're talking about when we say something's a human right. Uh, thirdly, um, yes, uh, you, you said a number of different things. I'm not sure that I can uh, pick them all up. I didn't even note them all down. But I did note one question about are British Muslims playing the kind of role that um, Jewish, English Jewish, English Jewry played 
in the early 20th century in relation to uh, the refugees and so on in order to, if you like, get them more accepted within you know, the norms of British society. Um, yeah, I don't know whether they are. Actually, they probably are not. One thing that uh, I, I think there is a parallel is that, um, of course, you know, we're talking about early 20th century before welfare state and so on. Uh, British Jewry played, uh, created lots of significant philanthropic organizations, which some of which will, uh, still exist. And I think Muslims are doing that. Um, again, I, I've seen some statistics, but I haven't done any research on this in any detailed way. But Muslims are very significant charity givers. I mean, it's obviously a religious duty, especially in, in the month of Ramadan. Um, and Muslims give a lot to charity. Until very recently, most of the money went abroad to, uh, you know, needy Muslims elsewhere, victims of famine and floods and refugees and so on. But some Muslims now consciously in the last few years have said, look, we're British citizens. When other British citizens are in need, we must help them. And so we had a flood in the Lake District um, two years ago. And one of the first charity aid helpers to arrive was a group of Muslims and there are virtually no Muslims in the Lake District. If you know anything about English geography, you'll know it's a totally non-urban area. It's not, it's not, there are hardly any Muslims there whatsoever. But they came from some urban location, probably like Manchester, Lancashire. And it was kind of quite amazing. Who are these people that suddenly arrived? And they came, you know, with uh, food and warm clothes and shelter and so on. So I think there's a parallel there. Finally, you said that uh, mainstream Muslim criticism has not been heard enough about um, violence and terrorism and so on uh, carried out by Muslims or at least in the name of Islam. Yeah, that's probably true, but what exactly does it mean? I mean, one of the things it means is that Muslims don't have a lot of access to um, the mass media. You know, they can't command attention uh, without, of course, you know, blowing someone up. Yes, then they'll get a lot of attention. Um, so that is a factor. The, the other uh, thing which is related is when you want to do your condemning, you know, like condemning an action and so on, you want to do it in your own way. And a lot of people have been demanding that Muslims do it in a particular way and avoid other ways. So, for instance, you know, the Iraq war. A lot of British Muslims want to say, we condemn the terrorism and, you know, bin Laden and uh, later ISIS and all that sort of stuff as we condemn the American and British-led invasion of Iraq with, you know, the massive, massive loss of life that that's caused. Uh, much, much bigger than anything any Muslim terrorists have caused. Um, but the politicians don't want to allow that. So they immediately take the microphone away from you. Oh, thank you. We won't be calling you to any one of our meetings again. And this has been a problem, that Muslims are not allowed to speak in their own voice. You know, they're not allowed to speak in a dialogical way. The criticism that they are allowed to make is the criticism other people want to hear, but they're not allowed to make the criticism that they want to make as well. So this is exactly the one-way criticism problem. And finally, um, your question, uh, Rita, about to what extent is this story British? Because the thinking about racism and so on seems to be quite British. Yes, I think um, it is. Of course, uh, our thinking about race is quite borrowed from the United States as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, obviously, there's a shared history, but I think from the 1960s in particular, with you know, Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement, the more uh, black identity-based nationalism of people like Malcolm X, who of course became a Muslim, and, and so on. So we, we have, and, and the, the legislation passed by the federal government, though short of affirmative action, we've never had that in Britain. But um, 
the idea of indirect discrimination and direct discrimination, um, and you know, quite a lot we borrowed from the American of America of the 1960s and 70s. But we have, of course, made it British. We've adapted it to our own circumstances and given it certain kinds of inflections and limitations. Um, and initially, I'd, I'd say, because a lot of my work, uh, my lecture was about you know, how uh, social scientists speak about these things. And I was kind of saying, oh, they do too much of this and too little of this and so on. Um, and I think the British study of race and racism has also made its own distinctive contribution, which isn't the same as, as the American. So for instance, as I understand it, lots of American social science still is, when it studies racism, is still very focused on color racism, whereas that's not the case in Britain. We have a much more uh, plural understanding of racism, though of course anti-black racism is very central, undeniably central. Um, but you are right. Um, a lot of what I'm saying resonates with uh, a British public culture in the way that it wouldn't resonate with a French or German one. Yeah, I would accept that. I think we can conclude here. Thank you very much for the lecture. Thank you very much for coming.